الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الدين عند الله الإسلام رب شوه لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل الأقدة من لساني يفقه قولي I welcome all the viewers of the Peace TV Network, that is the Peace TV English, the Peace TV Urdu, the Peace TV Bangla, as well as the Peace TV Chinese, as well as the people watching us on the various social media platforms, that is YouTube, Facebook, and Instagram. I welcome all of you with the Islamic greetings. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. May the peace, mercy, and blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, of Almighty God, be upon all of you. Inshallah, we will be starting the session, Ask Dr. Zakir and his son Farik. Inshallah, we will be starting Season 3, Session 3. And Inshallah, I will answer to the questions that you have posed. So let's take the first question. Assalamu alaikum. I am Taufiq Umar from India. Please advise our youth how to use the social media in an Islamic way and what is prohibited in it, especially WhatsApp and Facebook. Social media, it has a huge reach. The most popular among the social media, it is the Facebook. It has more than 2.5 billion monthly active users after that it is YouTube which has 2 billion monthly active users so social media it has a huge reach and social media per se it is not haram there are various social media platforms for example YouTube Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, etc. Social media can be used for the good purpose or can be used for the bad purpose. For example, a knife. It can be used for cutting fruits, whereas the same knife can be used for killing human beings. It depends upon how you use the knife. Similarly, social media, it depends upon how you use it. But unfortunately, majority of the people they use social media for non-beneficial things rather than beneficial things majority of the people they use social media for non-productive things rather than productive things whenever we are using social media we should see to it that we do not break any rule of the sharia it should be within the purviews of the islamic sharia and we should not break any rule of the sharia this is very important and social media it involves in many things that are haram and we should abstain from this for example youtube on youtube you have the advertisements and more than 95 percent of these advertisements they have something that is haram they either have women without hijab or they have music even Facebook, it has things that are haram, women without hijab, music, obscenity, nudity, etc. All these things, they are available on Facebook. Women dressed in inappropriate clothes. So we should abstain from watching all of this. So whenever we are using social media, we should see to it that it is within the purviews of the Islamic Sharia and that we do not break the rules of the Islamic Sharia. And as you asked in your question regarding WhatsApp, WhatsApp, it is a messaging application which is a substitute for the telephone, email, fax, etc. And it is more used for halal rather than haram. It is used for the haram things. For example, chatting with the namahram, chatting with people of the opposite gender. Also, it is used for dating. 
so it is used for things that are haram but whenever we are using it we should see to it that we abstain from these things that are haram and we have several channels on youtube certain channels they involve in things that are haram in fact majority of the channels in fact majority of the channels they involve in something that is haram we have the example of t series which is the most popular youtube channel it has no less than 123 billion views not million billion but it is used for the haram majority of the things on this channel they involve in things that are haram women without hijab music women dressed inappropriately they have huge popularity but we should see to it whenever we are using the social media that we do not involve in anything that is haram we can use the same social media for conveying the message of islam for doing dawa to the non muslims to those who are unaware of it and if we use it for propagating the message of islam inshallah we will get reward for this we can have daily vid videos we can have monthly videos we can have weekly videos because social media it has a huge reach so we should use it for our benefit and we should use it for conveying the message of islam to the non muslims to those who are unaware of it and every person who embraces islam after hearing your lectures or after seeing any of your videos you will get huge rewards for this whatever good deeds that person does you will get a share of his rewards so it is a very good opportunity for you to use the social media for conveying the message of islam whether it be youtube whether it be facebook even whatsapp can be used for conveying the message of islam you can share good islamic videos among your friends among your colleagues on groups etc so in this way we can very well use the social media for our benefit and use it for conveying the message of islam to the non muslims to those who are unaware of it The next question my name is Ajmal Saifi I'm from India city Polkua I want to know how to do dawa and where to start What is the first step of dawa do you have any course to learn dawa Dawa is compulsory upon every single muslim and whenever we do dawa it should be with wisdom and beautiful preachings as allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the glorious quran in surah nahl chapter number 16 verse number 25 ud'u ila sabili rabbika bil hikmah wal mau'izati al hasana wajadilhum bil lati hiya ahsan invite to the way of thy lord with wisdom and beautiful preachings and argue with them and reason with them in the ways that are best and most gracious and being a part time dai it is compulsory upon every single muslim and there are various strategies of conveying the message of islam some are less effective others are more effective one of the most common strategy used by majority of the muslims is that whenever they meet a non muslim they speak to him a hundred good points about islam even if the non muslim he agrees with all the hundred good points that have been spoken yet at the back of his mind he will have a few negative points he will say i do agree with what you are what you have said but you are the same muslim who's a terrorist ah you are the same muslim who's a fundamentalist you are the people who marry more than one woman you are the same people who have spread your religion at the point of the sword these few negative points at the back of his mind will prevent him from accepting the beauty of islam that's the reason when i meet a non muslim what i prefer i ask him up front what do you feel is wrong with islam with the limited knowledge whether right or wrong what do you feel is wrong with islam and i make him comfortable and after he's made comfortable he poses three or four questions and there are a set of 20 most common questions asked by non muslims regarding islam every muslim should be aware of these 20 most common questions 
it is better to know the answers of 20 most common questions rather than knowing the answers of 100 uncommon questions. And if we are aware of the answers of these 20 most common questions, even if the non-Muslim, if he doesn't embrace Islam, at least we can neutralize the animosity that is there in his mind regarding Islam. Besides this, we should talk about the commonalities in the major world religions. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the glorious Quran, in Surah Ali Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 64. قُلْ يَهْلِ الْكِتَابِ Say, O people of the book, تَعَالَوْا إِلَىٰ كَلِمَةٍ سَوَاءٍ بَيْنَنَا وَبَيْنَكُمْ Come to common terms as between us and you. Which is the first term? أَلَّا نَعْبُدَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ That we worship none but one Almighty God. وَلَا نُشِّكَ بِهِ شَيْئًا That we associate no partners with Him. وَلَا يَتَّخِذَ بَعْضُنَا بَعْضًا أَرْبَابًا مِن دُونِ اللَّهِ That we erect not among ourselves lords and patrons other than Allah. فَإِن تَوَلَّوْا If then they turn back. فَقُولُ شَدُوا Say ye bear witness, be anna muslimoon, that we are Muslims bowing our will to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the thing that we need to do is talk about the commonalities in the major world religions. And all the major world religions of the world, they talk about monotheism. That is the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Whether it be Hinduism, whether it be Christianity, whether it be Buddhism, all of the major world religions, they talk about monotheism. That is the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we should talk about the commonalities in the major world religions. And besides this, there is also a Dawah training program that has been conducted and the material is available online on the website www.zakirnaik.com and you can refer to the material. It shows the various techniques, the tips that are related to Dawah, how to convey the message of Islam regarding question and answer sessions, regarding debates, all of these things they are covered in this Dawah training program. The material is available online, you can refer to it and inshallah it will help you immensely when you're doing Dawah to the non-Muslims, when you're conveying the message of Islam to the non-Muslims. So it is very important that you convey the message of Islam to the non-Muslims, to those who are unaware of it. The next question. Assalamu alaikum. I have a brother who is a Christian and is reconsidering Islam. Being a comparative religious scholar, what would be the most important point to make to this brother so he knows how Islam is superior to Christianity? The first thing that we need to do is talk about the commonalities that are there in Islam and in Christianity. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Ali Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 64. ila kalimatin sawa'im Come to common terms as between us and you. Which is the first term? Allah na'budu illallah. That we worship none but one Almighty God. And Islam is the only non-Christian faith which makes it an article of faith for its followers to believe in Jesus Christ, peace be upon him. No Muslim is a Muslim if he does not believe in Jesus Christ, peace be upon him. We believe that he was one of the mightiest messengers of God. We believe that he was the Messiah translated Christ. We believe that he was born miraculously without any main intervention which many modern day Christians today do not believe. We believe that he gave life to the dead with God's permission. We believe that he healed those born blind and lepers with God's permission. The Muslims and the Christians, we are going together. But one may ask, then where are the parting of ways? The parting of ways are, there are many Christians who say that Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, he claimed divinity, he said that he was almighty God. In fact, if you read the Bible, there is not a single unequivocal statement, not a single unambiguous statement in the complete Bible where Jesus Christ, peace be upon you, himself says, I am God or where he says, worship me. In fact, if you read the Bible, Jesus Christ, peace be upon him said, it is mentioned in the Gospel of John, chapter number 14, verse number 28, my father is greater than I. Gospel of John, chapter number 10, verse number 29, my father is greater than all. Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 12, verse number 28, I cast out devil with the spirit of God. Gospel of Luke, chapter number 11, verse number 20, I with the finger of God, cast out devil. Gospel of John, chapter number 5, verse number 30, I can of my own self do nothing. 
as I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just, for I seek not my will, but the will of my Father. Anyone who says, I seek not my will, but the will of Almighty God, he is a Muslim. Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, was a Muslim. And Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, he never claimed divinity. In fact, if you read it, it's clearly mentioned in the book of Acts, chapter number 2, verse number 22, ye men of Israel, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God amongst you by wonders and miracles and signs, which God did by himself and you are witness to it. A man approved of God amongst you by wonders and miracles and signs, which God did by himself and you are witness to it. So Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, he never claimed divinity. And he repeated verbatim what was said by Moses, peace be upon him. It is mentioned in the Gospel of Mark, chapter number 12, verse number 29. Shama Israelo, Adna Ilahaina Adna Ikhad, Yero Israel, the Lord, our God is one Lord. So Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, he never claimed divinity. So if we read the Bible, we shall understand that you have to worship only one God and you have to worship him alone without associating partners with him. Now, if all religions basically teach good, then what's the difference between Islam and the other religions? For example, all religions say that we should not rob. Christianity says that, Hinduism says that, and Islam says that. So what's the difference between Islam and the other religions? Islam, besides telling you to do good, it shows you a practical way how to achieve that state of goodness. In Islam, we have a system of zakah. Every rich person who has a saving of more than the Nisab level, he should give 2.5% of saving every lunar year in charity. If every rich man gives charity, poverty will eradicate from this world. There will not be a single human being who will die of hunger. And after that, if any man robs chopping of the hands, certain people might say chopping of the hands in this 21st century. Islam is a barbaric religion. Islam is a ruthless religion. And people say, America, it is an advanced country. It is the most advanced country in the world. Do you know America, it has the highest rate of crime and theft. I am asking the question that if you implement the Islamic Sharia, that there should be a system of zakah, every rich person who has a saving of more than the sub level of more than 85 grams of gold, he should give 2.5% of his saving every lunar year in charity. And after that, if any man robs chopping of the hands, I am asking the question that will the rate of robbery in America, will it increase, will it remain the same, or will it decrease? But naturally it will decrease. You implement the Sharia and you get results. I would like to give you another example. All religions say that a woman should be dressed modestly. Islam says that, Christianity says that, and Hinduism says that. But Islam, besides talking about hijab for the woman, it shows you a practical way how to achieve that state of goodness. All religions, they say that you should not rape a woman. Christianity says that, Islam says that, Hinduism says that. But Islam, besides saying that you should not rape a woman, it shows you a practical way how to achieve that state of goodness. In Islam, we have a system of hijab. That the woman she should be dressed modestly. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Nur, chapter number 24, verse number 30. Qul lil mu'minina yaghuddu min absarihim wa yahfadhu furujahum. Say to the believing man that he should lower his gaze and guard his modesty. The next verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Nur, chapter number 24, verse number 31. Qul lil mu'minati yaghuddna min absarihinna wa yahfadhna furujahun. Say to the believing woman that she should lower her gaze and guard her modesty. And display not her beauty except what is ordinary thereof and tell her to draw her veil over bosoms and display not her beauty except in front of their husbands, their fathers, their sons. And there's a big list of mehrams of close relatives who you cannot marry. There are basically six criteria for hijab that are mentioned in the glorious Quran and in the authentic hadith. The first is the extent for the man and for the woman. For the man, it's from the navel to the knee. For the woman, it is the complete body should be covered. The only parts that can be seen are the face and the hands up to the wrist. The remaining five criteria are same for the man and for the woman. The second, the clothes they wear, it should be loose. It should not be tight fitting. It should not reveal the figure. The third, 
is that it should not be translucent or transparent. The fourth, that it should not be so glamorous that attracts the opposite gender. The fifth, it should not be that of the opposite gender. And the sixth is that it should not resemble that of the unbeliever. These are basically six criteria for hijab. And in Islam, we have a system of hijab. And after that, if any man rapes any woman, capital punishment, death penalty. Certain people might say, death penalty in this 21st century. Islam is a barbaric religion. Islam is a ruthless religion. America, being one of the most advanced countries in the world, it has the highest rate of rape. I am asking the question that if you implement the Islamic Sharia, that every woman she should be dressed modestly, and after that, if any man rapes any woman, capital punishment, death penalty, I am asking the question that will the rate of rape in America will it increase, will it remain the same, or will it decrease? But naturally, it will decrease. You implement the Sharia and you get results. So Islam, besides teaching good, it shows you a practical way how to achieve that state of goodness. That makes Islam different from the other religions. We will take the next question. I am Prashant from India. My question to you is that is it a sin to convert into Islam and yet continue doing idol worship as I belong to a Hindu background? Is secretly converting to Islam permissible? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the glorious Quran in Surah Nisa chapter number 4 verse number 48 and Surah Nisa chapter number 4 verse number 116 إن الله لا يغفر أن يشرك به ويغفر ما دون ذلك لمن يشاء. That Allah Subhanahu wa Taala He will never forgive the sin of shirk, but He may forgive any other sin if He pleases. So shirk it is the biggest sin in Islam. Idol worship it is completely prohibited in Islam. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says in Surah Ikhlas, chapter number 112, verse number one: "Qul huwa Allahu ahad." Say He is Allah one and only. So we have to believe in one God alone and we cannot associate partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Idol worship is completely prohibited in Islam. And a similar message is also mentioned in the Hindu scriptures. The Hindu scriptures, it says that you have to believe in one God alone and idol worship is prohibited. It's mentioned in Chandogya Upanishad, chapter number 6, section number 2, verse number 1. Ikkam ivdityam. God is only one without a second. It's mentioned in Sutta Upanishad, chapter number 6, verse number 9. Na chasya kasaj janita na chadipa. Which means of that Lord, he has got no superior, he has got no lords, he has got no parents, he has got no father, he has got no mother. Furthermore, it's mentioned in Sutta Upanishad, chapter number 4, verse number 19. Na tasi pratima asti. Of that God, there is no pratima. Pratima in Sanskrit, it means images, photographs, sculptures, paintings, statues, pictures, idols, etc. Furthermore, it's mentioned in Yajurved, chapter number 40, verse number 8. Almighty God, He is imageless and pure. It is mentioned in Yajurved, chapter number 40, verse number 9. Andhatma pravishanti ya asambuti mupaste. They are entering into darkness, those who worship the asambuti. That is the natural things like fire, water, air, etc. And the verse continues and says, They are entering more in darkness, those who worship the sambuti. That is the created things like table, chair, idols, etc. Who says that? Yajur Ved, chapter number 40, verse number 9. Furthermore, it's mentioned in Atharva Ved, book number 20, hymn number 58, mantra number 3. Dev Maha Osi, verily great is Almighty God. And the Brahma Sutra, the fundamental creed of Hinduism is Ekkam Braham Dutya Naste, Nehna Naste Kinchan. Bhagwan Eki hai, Dusra Nahi hai, Nahi hai, Nahi hai, Zara bhi nahi hai. There's only one God, not a second one. Not at all, not at all, not in the least bit. So if you read the Hindu scriptures, you shall understand that you have to believe in only one God. You have to worship him alone without associating partners. And idol worship is completely prohibited according to Hindu scriptures. Even according to the Bible, idol worship it is prohibited. And the Bible says that you have to believe in one God alone. 
It is mentioned in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter number 6, verse number 4, as well as in the gospel of Mark, chapter number 12, verse number 29. Shama Israelo, Adonai Ilahain, Adonai Chad, Yoro Israel, the Lord, our God is one Lord. Furthermore, it is mentioned in the book of Exodus, chapter number 20, verse number 3 to 5. Thou shall have no other God besides me. Thou shalt not make any graven image of any likeness of anything in the heaven above, in the earth beneath, in the water beneath the earth. Thou shalt not bow down to them, nor serve them, for I, thy Lord, thy God, is a jealous God. So even the Bible clearly prohibits idol worship. And it says that you have to believe in one God alone. All the major world religions, they talk about monotheism, that is the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And as far as your last part of the question wherein you said, can you accept Islam secretly? It is not compulsory that you have to proclaim that you have embraced Islam. You can keep it as a secret, but you should see to it that you can do all the faraid, for example, offering salah, giving zakah, fasting, etc. And slowly you should also convey the message of Islam to your parents, you should talk to them regarding Islam and try to convince them, do dawah to them and inshallah, eventually they will also embrace Islam. We will take the last question. Assalamu alaikum. My name is Ramiz Ibn Rafiq from Cochin, Kerala. My question is, the people who have entered into heaven, will they remain in it permanently? Or do, or do they have a life after that? Or do they need to face any test again? There are two types of people. The first is those people who will be punished for their sins and then later on they will enter into paradise. In this category, there are two more categories. The first is those people who will be punished in the grave or in this world. The second is those people who will be punished in the hereafter in hellfire and then later on they will enter paradise. So certain people they will be punished in, here, in the hereafter and they will enter hellfire. They will have to pay for their sins. Later on they will enter paradise. And the second category of people are those people who will directly enter paradise. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He will forgive certain people. He can forgive whomsoever He wills. So even if we have committed sins, if we ask true, true repentance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, inshallah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He will forgive us. So even if certain people, they have committed sins, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He will forgive them and He will directly admit them in the gardens of paradise. And Abdullah Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, He said, and this hadith is narrated, it is mentioned in Sahih al-Bukhari and Sahih Muslim that when the people of paradise will enter paradise and when the people of hellfire will enter hellfire, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will say to the people of hellfire that bring them out from hellfire. So these people, they will be brought out from hellfire and they will be like burnt skeletons. They will be like charcoal. Later on, they will be put into the river of life and they will grow like a seed. And they will have a new life. And then later on, they will enter into paradise. So certain people, they will have to pay for their sins and later on, they will enter into paradise. And is there a life after that, after we enter paradise? No, once we enter paradise, we will live therein forever for eternity and those people who have committed shirk, their abode will be the hellfire. So we should see to that we do not fall into the state of shirk and will there be a test after this? We come in this world once, we are tested once and based on our deeds we either enter paradise or we either enter hellfire. And even in paradise there are several levels in paradise. The highest is Jannatul Firdaus. So we pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, may he admit us in the gardens of paradise and, to and into the highest level of paradise that is Jannatul Firdaus. Ameen. I would like to end this session and inshallah the remaining part of the session will be continued by my father. Wa akhiru da'awana and alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen.